Thank you, Anne, for the kind introduction, dear colleagues. Uh, um, I am very glad to be here today and to talk with you about the beginnings um, of the UN. Um, thank you for the invitation um, and, and for being here. By the way, I dropped the old title, as some of you might, uh, might uh, already have noticed. It obviously was too complicated. Huh? And the new title, Not Built on Wishful Thinking, um, is also the title of a written text uh, of which I brought along a provisional copy here for those who are interested in um, some more details. So, not built on wishful thinking with a question mark. The title refers to a quote by Franklin Roosevelt who said in March 1945 that the UN should not be built on wishful thinking. He didn't say it uh, but he meant, of course, that the League of Nations was built on such wishful thinking. The topic I want to talk about is not the creation as such, but the perception of the creation back then when the UN was set up. And now, 21st century, also late 20th century, I am interested in the contrast between these perceptions, which is I find quite remarkable and deserves at least some thoughts. Let me exaggerate a little. Nowadays, the creation tends to appear as a, um, as a relatively idealistic act, relatively given the well-known role of the Security Council, but at least an act which marks a clear break, um, or at least a break with the tragic past. The whole year 1945 tends to appear as such a break, and the creation of the UN has become, become part of the 1945 as year zero narrative with a number of elements, um, the end of the war, the liberation of the concentration camps, the creation of the UN with human rights mentioned in the preamble of the charter, etc. This break narrative is interesting in my view because it contrasts um, with the perception by many or probably most contemporaries of the founding in principle we can say the great power, the three or four great powers, uh, the US, the UK, the Soviet Union, and also at some point uh, China, were on the whole satisfied back then. And the rest, also the other allies, grumbled or even were angry. A Turkish minister in San Francisco, for example, criticized that the new world organization is made to make lawful the projects of the great powers and to even ensure them impunity. Small and middle powers felt that they were about to become satellites. So the perception then was that the UN is a product of sober realism, even hyper-realism. I remember the old title I dropped, Naked Power Politics with Tiny Human Rights Decoration. It was, by the way, of course, no coincidence that the San Francisco conference took place still during the war, so it was not a peace conference proper. This was Roosevelt's strong will. He said, this time we shall not make the mistake of waiting until the end of war to set up the new machinery of peace. The UN in its beginning uh, in its beginnings was a kind of extension of the war coalition of the Allies. You all know this founded by the Allies, not even neutral states were admitted to the founding as a Swiss. Uh, I know this, of course. Interestingly, for our purpose, an independent observer in San Francisco said that he does not encounter here the old Geneva type of statesman, not at all. A new kind of statesman dominates in San Francisco, he said and wrote, a more sober one, a more illusionless a more illusionless one, an entirely realist one. I was asking myself, why do we nowadays typically perceive the founding differently from them? I speak of the discipline in general, uh, our discipline and the wider public, not the very specialized discourse in which a more nuanced view um, can be found. Why do we perceive the founding as the break despite these sobering experiences by contemporaries? This is what I want to talk about, this contrast in perceptions. My explanation in brief is twofold. On the one hand, I will argue that the massive downsizing of post-war order plans during the war played a significant role for the perception back then. I will sketch this downsizing 
In the last two years of the war, when the end became foreseeable, the project of the New World Organization became much less um, ambitious and much more a mirror, a mere mirror of the power constellation. On the other hand, I will argue that the predominant present, um, let's say 21st century perception, the break narrative, the clear break narrative, is closely connected with the periodization problem, the necessity to periodize history, to make the history of international law a presently convincing narrative. But let me begin with the big picture of the founding. We always have to keep in mind when we talk about um, the, the UN's founding that it was part of a whole bundle of decisions, mainly by the three allies. There was no founding as such, uh, as a single event, um, but only as a part of a number of deals between the big three, um, only in principle, only the US, only Franklin Roosevelt in particular, really wanted the new organization. The Soviet Union had completely different interests, territorial gains in particular, mainly in Eastern Europe, but not only. Sakhalin, for example, also the, the formerly Japanese island, to compensate for um, the immense um, loss of lives. And the British primarily wanted to keep um, their empire. Churchill had no particular interest in the UN. And the US, and this is uh, the crucial point, needed the Soviet Union in the war against Japan. So they made what we call a package deal. I simply a little, which included getting the Soviet Union into the project somehow, uh, which meant accepting the veto. Soviet territorial gains and leaving the British, their empire, more or less untouched. For the Soviet Union, the veto had become a conditio sine qua non um, already in 1944, which had the consequence that the room for a more ambitious UN became very limited in 1945. So this is the starting point. But which had been the plans before? which were significant for the perception by contemporaries. And it's important to note that that such early and uh, quite ambitious plan um, did not only concern the security architecture, but also other fields on which I will say a few words. But let me start with uh, stability, security. The US began to reflect on the new security architecture very early, already in 1937. Yeah. You haven't misunderstood me, it was 1937. They reflected on a new world organization led by the US and the UK. And in the first years of the war, the US temporarily even wanted a group of world policemen, um, first the, the US and the UK, and at some point also Soviet Union, which would disarm the whole rest, all the other states to secure world peace. So highly ambitious plans. Um, Roosevelt was determined to effect, effectively secure stability, but even the UK was not um, really supporting these plans. The UK needed the US in, in the war against uh, the Axis powers and did not protest too loudly, of course. What Churchill wanted was rather a League of Nations-like organization and regional stability. He didn't believe in, in the global approach. And the far-reaching plans um, came to an end when Stalin came up with the veto claim. Um, Roosevelt, in fact, did not have uh, a choice. He had to accept this, otherwise he wouldn't have got Stalin into the war against Japan. In early 1945, um, um, American officials estimated that it will cost the U.S. at least another half million American lives um, to, to win the war against Japan. Um, and the result of all this was a hyper-realist, as I call it, Security Council with the um, famous or infamous veto right. Um, let us look now at other fields of downsized plans, which were also important for the, the overall perception of what was going on in San Francisco. I begin with self-government and decolonization. The Atlantic Charter of 1941, which was the um, the US-UK um, understanding on their war aims um, contains seven principles, and two of them nourished hopes of colonial peoples um, for independence, for autonomy. Um, 
one of these principles stated that the new order shall be based on the right of all peoples um, to choose their form of government, uh, government themselves, and that self-government of those who have been deprived of it shall be restored. So the words were vague, of course, but the idea was very clear, and the charter finally adopted. It was a long um, journey, um, was a, a setback, dramatic setback for these people. Um, colonialism survived almost untouched. Some say it even gained new strength through the new world organization. You may ask now, what about Article 1 of the Charter, um, which mentions self-determination? Of course, it is not nothing, but um, in fact, there was not a hint of an obligation to lead these peoples towards independence. The UN of 1945 more or less reinvented and re uh, renamed the old mandate system. Almost exclusively former enemy territories and mandates were included into the trusteeship council system and the supervision authority and um, deliberately was weak. So it's quite telling that during the conference in San Francisco, France bombed insurgents in Damascus. It, it already was clear that colonialism would survive at least um, for a while. Next field, um, human rights. Um, again, Roosevelt played a key role. Um, in the, the general perception and, and in fact, what's really interesting and not self-evident is that he recognized an immediate connection between fundamental rights on the one hand and security on the other. In uh, his State of the Union address of 1941, so still before Pearl Harbor, he mentioned his famous four freedoms, speech, worship, freedom from want and freedom from fear for the first time public, and afterwards the formula of these freedoms um, partly uh, was included into Atlantic Charter and then the declaration by United Nations of January 1942. Um, I think it's noteworthy in this connection that there had not been a political or intellectual movement in the, in the interwar years to defend liberty as such against fascism and communism. Freedom was rather understood as part of the postulate of democracy. So people rather defended democracy and not liberty as such alone. But what do we find of um, Roosevelt's ideas in the UN Charter, in the text? Um, human rights were a peripheral topic, almost just declaration. Uh, at some point, it was even completely dropped uh, in, uh, in 1944. And sometimes it was, it was crossed out uh, and it came back in in 1945. So um, um, in, the, in, in the text finally adopted, the topic is mentioned among the purposes that's a fact, but none of the provisions grants a concrete um, guarantee upon which an individual could rely on when the drafts were discussed, the Soviet, Soviet Union made clear that it would never accept something like a catalog. It's a bourgeois thing, of course. Um, Stalin denied um, any connection between security and such rights. And even the US had um, gave the topic a low priority at that point of the war. Um, Soviet support in, in the war against Japan has become much more important. So it was just, it was, peripheral topic. There are other fields also interesting, um, economic and social cooperation uh, in particular, and also rule of law. Just very briefly, um, um, uh, with respect to cooperation, interestingly, the UK and China at some point wanted a relatively strong executive council, so a body for economic and social cooperation to become even the core body of the organization. And after the League's failure in this field, I have to add that the League of Nations had operated by way of relatively weak commissions in the field of social and economic matters. So um, just immediately before the war in 1939, um, they, uh, they, they were thinking about um, a revision, which was much too late at that point. Um, or um, just briefly with respect to the rule of law, 
mandatory jurisdiction was discussed at some point. Some states claimed it by a world court, not the great powers of court, but uh, also this idea was discussed. What I want to say is all this together, all this downsizing, is, it's different stories in these different fields, but all this together had the effect that the UN finally created predominantly was perceived as a realist um, or hyper-realist construction. Now, possibly welcome, welcome for most, as more could simply not be reached, but nevertheless clearly dif disappointing if you read um, the sources. Despite all the polite words said at the final ceremony in San Francisco, which nowadays are so frequently quoted, these were, the, were polite words, of course, and it was a final ceremony. I come to the second part of my explanation of this contract, uh, my provisional explanation between the perception back then and the nowadays uh, predominant uh, narrative, this uh, break story, this clear break story. We have to talk about the connection between this break narrative and the topic of periodization, um, um, about what we do when we periodize um, be it the history in general or history of international law and why we do this and what the consequences of periodizing are. The predominance of break narratives can be better understood in my view if we have this problem in mind and not just the, um, the founding as such. Let me begin by saying for those who are not familiar with this topic of historiography, there is always a necessity to periodize history. We cannot talk about the past in any way without cutting the time axis into pieces. Time units we consider meaningful, the era of the League, of the UN, uh, Cold War era. Um, I, I have published a piece on this uh, some time ago. And the essence which seems relevant to me here is we periodize in order to organize our knowledge. We have to organize our knowledge somehow of the world, of international law, of events like World War I, of the founding. And such periods are never, never objective. Uh, they are not the facts themselves, even, even if they appear as such. They are just interpretations, uh, provisional interpretation by those who talk about history. And um, the key point here is, a lot could be said, and if there's they are always, ultimately, they're always guided by current needs and also values, ultimately by the present. Um, so these current needs and values shape the past, and the perception of the past, through specific periodization concepts, which tell stories about beginnings and ends, with their logic of, of eras, of narratives, and implicitly um, always also stories about what is legitimate. My point is in the present, there is such an obvious um, and pressing need uh, demand for a good world organization, a legitimate and functioning organization to solve um, the problems of our time. And there is a, a connection between this need and our inclination to tell the founding story as a story of a break, of a clear break, of pure colors. Of course, the UN of 1945 was in no way the organization we nowadays need, but the number of its elements easily can be imagined as its beginning. The founding was a direct uh, answer, of course, to the horrible violence, obviously a key topic today, and uh, the charter denounces this violence as the enemy, um, and it mentions self-determination, human rights, etc. You know this, and you know the story. The charter offers itself as a cesura, many of its elements, when we in the present search for perspective, sometimes we can say desperately search for perspective to enhance the UN's legitimacy. I think of the whole discourse on um, global, uh, global constitutional law. The basic fact is no alternative of, to the present UN is in sight. There's only this UN we have, and so the founding in a way, we can say, has a double life as an event as such and as an element of narratives about international law's history and its implications um, for the present and future. So when we look back to 1945, we intuitively concentrate on those aspects we can imagine as part of the, of the present 
UN and um, of the UN we nowadays need and wish. But let me add a, a brief final thought. Um, uh, what role does later knowledge of the UN and its development play in this context? Knowledge um, after 1945. So later knowledge, how does it influence our perception of the finding? Um, founding. The point I want to make is we cannot unknow this later knowledge, how the UN developed since 1945. It is in our mind and it influences our perception too, whether we want it um, or not. For example, our knowledge that the UN developed from an accomplice of clearly accomplice of late colonialism um, to an organization which denounces colonialism as a crime, or the development of human rights, uh, covenants, special treaties, R2P, etc. You know, uh, you all know this. And of course, you can denounce this as anachronistic thinking. Yeah? If we project back what we know, and the, I would say th theoretically, you're completely right. But what I want to say is, it is not so easy to really abstract from such later knowledge. Try to talk, for example, about the role of biologistic metaphors in 19th century social theory without, without always thinking about what happened with these metaphors in, in, in the 20th century and its excesses, the excesses of this thinking. So we, uh, later born, we know which roads were taken and which were not. And I, and this is my presumption that this knowledge also influences um, our intuition and thinking about the UN's beginning. So this is, um, this is my, my, my talk, my, my perception on the perception, a provisional perception um, of how it was and is perceived. And uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm, uh, I'm curious uh, to listen what, you, what your comments are, your criticisms, and uh, your questions. Many thanks. Mm -hmm.